Hebrews 4, 14 to 16. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we gather here together this morning, I pray that you would open your word to us, that you would teach us, that you would open our eyes to see the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, that in it you would give us hope, conviction, a mission, that you would give us assurance and boldness to maintain our confession to the end. I pray for those in here who might be unbelieving, that in what's said this morning in your word, they might have faith for the first time. I pray for the believing in here, that we would be reminded once again of the truth of the good news of Jesus Christ that we might hold fast to the end. That you would give us legs of endurance to run the race you've set before us and hope of eternal life in the age to come. Father, whatever it is, would you open your word to us this morning? Teach us, remind us, convict us, challenge us, point us towards Christ in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a famous scene in the middle of the Gospel of Matthew, and it's, it's pivotal to the story. It's the center of the book, and it's the point of the story where everything in the Gospel changes. It takes a turn. Jesus is asking his disciples what the word on the street is about him. Who do people say that I am, is what he asks them. And they tell him, well, some of the people say that you're John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others say Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But then he turns and asks his disciples, but who do you say that I am? What about about you? Who do you say that I am? As his disciples who have traveled with him, they've seen all his works, they've heard his teaching, this question is hanging in the air for them. After all of this, after everything that you have seen me do, heard me teach, After all of this, what do you believe about me? What we actually believe about Jesus really matters. What we say about Him really matters. This morning we're going to spend our time together looking at why the author of Hebrews wants us to hold fast to our confession about Jesus Christ. And we have to understand what it is that we're confessing about Him first, and then understand why it's important that we confess that for our lives. I want to look only at verse 14 this morning in the text that's in front of you, because this verse is actually going to help us not only recap some of the things that we've been talking about before chapter 4, so it'll be a good kind of review of the things that we've benefited from up to this point, but it will also point us toward where we're going in the future, which is to remind us about Jesus, our high priest. So I want us to look just at verse 14 this morning. 
Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Over the last few weeks, the author of Hebrews has been telling us what he wants us to strive for. To strive for eternal rest that God has for us. He wants to enter into eternal life. That's what he wants for every single one of us. That's what every pastor wants for his congregation. That's what every pastor wants for himself. Now, you'll notice that he's transitioning back to talking about Jesus as high priest, which isn't directly connected, it doesn't seem like, to the rest that he's been talking about for the last few weeks. That's because in verse 14, he's tur- returning to a topic that he started all the way back in chapter 2. And unless you're kind of reading through all together, you, you may not notice it. But all the way back in chapter 2, look back at chapter 2, verse 17. Probably just one page maybe flipped in your Bible. Chapter 2, verse 17, he says this, Therefore, he, meaning Christ, had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Therefore, holy brothers, You who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. So in our verse this morning, and really for the foreseeable future, as the author of Hebrews talks about Jesus the high priest, we're looking at what makes Jesus superior to all other prophets, to all other kings, to all other priests that have come before, who have attempted or those who have attempted to reach His level ever since. There are three things in this verse that He's saying about Jesus that we're going to take each one in its turn. And each of these is going to cause us to review some of the concepts that we saw earlier in the book. And so we're going to be flipping to the earlier portions of Hebrews a little bit, so just be ready for that. But we're going to take each one in its turn. Three things that we're going to look at. And the first one is that He is our great High priest. That's what he says there at the beginning of verse 14. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Now this issue right here is at the very heart of the Christian gospel. And it's pivotal that we understand it and that we can share it with others. Because if we can't understand what it means that he is our great high priest who has passed through the heavens, there's little to no chance that we'll actually be able to sit down with somebody who is unbelieving and be able to explain the gospel to him or her. The world of other religions will want to make Christianity and their religion all the same. Take all of them and put them on the same level. We're really saying the same thing, they'll say. But this point is one very important piece that sets Christianity apart from all others. Jesus is our great high priest. Now first we have to recognize that there is a problem that you and I have before God. The God who made the world and everything in it is holy and righteous and perfect in every respect. And He made you, believe it or not, He made you and I to be perfect as well so that we might be able to steward His perfect world, so that we might be able to live with Him forever. Now when Adam disobeyed God, sin entered God's good creation, and as a result of that, man was condemned to die because he's no longer the perfect creature that God created him to be. So God created you to be perfect. Adam fell. In Adam, we all fell. We are no longer perfect Therefore, we deserve to die because we cannot fulfill the obligations that God created us for, a purpose for which God created us. But along with man's sin and punishment came a promise. And that promise was that one day, God would, instead of destroying us, would restore His world and redeem His people from their sin. 
But this is where the priesthood comes in. Because it serves a very important role in God's purposes of saving His people. So God instructs His people first to build Him a tabernacle and then eventually to build Him a temple. And at the same time, He establishes in the nation of Israel a priesthood from the tribes of Israel. A priesthood of the Levites. And that priesthood was responsible for one very important task. And that is to represent the sinful people of the nation of Israel before the Lord. So the Levites would carry out this role as priests. They would represent the sinful people before a holy God. Now the problem was that man was defiled from head to toe and from body to soul. And everything in between. Everything about him is completely defiled. Unclean and sinful. And so the priesthood was instructed on the regular to use sacrifice as a temporary but very necessary ritual. So we find this in Hebrews 9.13. Now we haven't gotten there yet, but this is coming. Hebrews 9.13, it says, The blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh. So, in order for this holy God to pause judgment, now he had the right, as soon as Adam took the fall, to just squash him right where he stood. None of us would have ever been born. He just started over right there if he wanted to. But in order for him to forestall his judgment, to put it on on hold, his people must be routinely cleansed from their defilement. That was the that was the process they had to go through. Then once a year, there was a day set aside called the Day of Atonement, where the high priest would enter into a special place in the temple called the Holy of Holies, and he would pass through this curtain. Behind this curtain, he was only allowed to go in once a year. He had to get in, do the thing, and then get out, and he couldn't spend very long in there, right? It was a one-time thing once a year. But he passed through this curtain that separated the regular part of the temple called the holy place, where just the priest would go, from the holy of holies. And once he was there, he would make one sacrifice for the past sins of the whole nation for that year, the past year. But the problem with all these sacrifices, including the one made by the high priest every year, is what we find in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 3 to 4. He says this, In these sacrifices, there is a reminder, a, a reminder of sins every year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So, so what is it that we... That we see that is significantly different about Jesus' role as high priest in our verse this morning versus those that we find in the past in Israel's history. See, Jesus is not merely a great high priest. He's not just saying, well, he's, he was a swell guy. He was a great high priest. But he's a great high priest that went somewhere. He actually traveled someplace. And it was somewhere beyond where the regular high priest could go. The regular high priest passed through the curtain. And there was in the presence of God. To an extent. But this high priest, Christ, the great high priest, passed through the heavens. And what he means is that our great high priest, because of his perfect righteousness, because he himself was not sinful, He was able to make atonement for the sins of His people, not in a temple made by hands, but before the throne of God Himself. So He was able to journey right directly into the presence of God Himself. So we read this back in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. Back when I preached this, I said maybe the most important 17 words in Scripture that you'll ever read. After making purification for sins, He sat down at the right hand of the Majesty on high. 
After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. The reason he's saying Jesus is our great high priest is because his perfect sacrifice for our sins and our defilement of every kind was so perfect that once he made this one-time sacrifice, he no longer had any work left to do. So he sat down. That's not something any other high priest could ever do. Every other high priest must continually stand and go back every year and make the same sacrifice for the past sins as a reminder of the sins because the blood of bulls and goats can never take away sin. They're still defiled. And here is the great high priest who did not pass behind the curtain. He tore the curtain in half. He traveled up through the heavens into the throne room of God. And once he had made the sacrifice of his life one time for all his people, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. The regular high priest will have to continually make sacrifice. But Jesus' role as high priest was one and done. Now every religion will seek to absolve itself of sin and defilement in various ways. Jews will keep kosher and will wash and now will confess sins because there's no temple at which to make sacrifices. Muslims will keep halal and wash and seek repentance and good deeds and regular prayers. Roman Catholics will seek penance They'll do good deeds and they'll participate in the sacraments of the Roman Catholic Church. Every religion will seek numerous ways to continually scrub and clean the defilement off of them that resulted from the fall. Every single one of us in this world can feel it. We all know it's there. And some of us wake up with it every morning knowing full well that there is defilement that we must be cleansed of. You can see this play out in every religion around the world. But the Christian gospel says that our defilement before God was once and for all cleansed by Jesus Christ. Because as our high priest, He took His perfect life, He went through the heavens into the throne room of God, and before God Himself offered His perfection as a sacrifice for all the sins and uncleannesses of His people. It was done. So then, if you are in Christ, this is what this means as our great high priest, if you are in Christ, you have no ceremonial uncleanliness, you have no lack of, of holiness, you have no sin that separates you or condemns you before God. Everyone in God's courtroom is declared not guilty if they are in Christ. That's what it means that He is our great High Priest. But what is the reason that He was our great High priest. How was he able to accomplish this feat? Because our second point, because he is the Son of God. He is our great high priest, but he is also the Son of God. He says, since then, look at 14, since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Now when we're talking about Jesus Christ, we're not talking about a mere prophet like Moses or Elijah. We're not looking at even the greatest among equals. Like he is another prophet, but he is foremost among them. We're looking at God the Son, who came in human form for the purposes of dying on the cross to save his people from sin and death. Now, the task of saving us is something a man had to accomplish. That was the charge given to Adam. A man. You must do this. The problem is, only God could accomplish it. No man could actually 
really accomplish it. A man had to accomplish it, but only God could accomplish it, especially once we had fallen. The Bible is not claiming that Jesus Christ is merely a prophet. He isn't merely a good man. He isn't merely a man. He is fully and truly God, and He is fully and truly man at the same time. But what do we mean that Jesus is the Son of God? He's, that's what He says here, that Jesus is the Son of God. And what do we mean that He's the Son of God? Remember how the author of Hebrews tells us in chapter 1, verse 3. Again, verse 3. Very important verse for the book of Hebrews, it turns out. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature. And He upholds the universe by the word of His power. So the first thing that we mean when we say that Jesus was the Son of God is that He is the exact imprint of God's very nature. We do not mean that He is the literal offspring of God as the Mormons teach. That God the Father procreated with some celestial being or woman or something and had a literal offspring in God the Son. That is not what we believe. That is what Mormons teach. We do not mean that He is the first of God's creation like Jehovah's Witness teach. We do not mean that He is a great prophet as Islam teaches. We don't mean that He was a first century rabbi as Jews teach. Neither of those suffice, or none of those explanations suffice for what we get in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. He is the exact imprint of His nature. And He upholds the universe by the word of His power. There's no rabbi that upholds the universe by the word of His power. There's no offspring that upholds the universe by the word of His power. Or that is the exact imprint of the nature of God. We believe that God the Father and God the Son, while being different in person, share the exact same nature so that Jesus can say to His disciples in John 14, 9, whoever has seen Me has seen the Father. Now, no son, no normal offspring would ever say that about his dad. I look a lot like my dad. I'm better looking, but still similar. I wouldn't say, if you've seen me, you've seen my dad. He's a lot uglier than I am, as an example. <laughs> but here Jesus says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. And the disciples are asking, show us the Father. What are you talking about? Have you been with me this whole time? And you don't know? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. We believe that there was never a time when God the Son did not exist. As John says in John 1, 1 to 3, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. These things cannot be said of a mere creation of God, nor of a prophet, nor of a rabbi. These kinds of things can only be said of someone who shares in the exact same nature of God Himself. But that's not the only thing that we mean when we say that Jesus is the Son of God. We also mean that He is the one sent to us to reveal God in full. And the one who stands to inherit all of creation as her King. Sons are sent from fathers. Sons, princes, if you will, are ambassadors of the royal family. What the prince says is true of the King. Because 
He is an emissary, an ambassador of the royal family. And sons are the ones who inherit the kingdom. That is what we mean also by Jesus is the Son of God. The author of Hebrews, again, introduces Jesus to us this way in Hebrews 1, 1 to 2. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom also He created the world. God was at one point in history pleased to reveal Himself through the prophets and through the writings of the Old Testament, through Moses, through Elijah, through Elisha, through David, through Jeremiah, through Ezekiel, through Daniel, through Hosea, through you name the prophet. He was pleased to reveal Himself to us by them. But now, He says, when it came to fully revealing Himself to us, to granting His people salvation, there was not a prophet on earth that could suffice. Who on earth would want that responsibility? To go before humanity and fully reveal God to them. No prophet, no mere prophet, would suffice. So who could He send? He could only send His ambassador, who is His very nature. Only one who shares in His exact nature. His eternal Son would suffice. That's what we mean when we say Jesus is the Son. He is the one sent. He is the one to inherit all of creation as His, as its King. So then John says of Jesus in John 1, verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now only a high priest who has passed through the heavens could fully cleanse us in such a way that we would be forever cleansed of our uncleannesses and purge us from our iniquity in the courtroom of God. But only one who is truly God and truly man could accomplish that feat. He had to be truly man because only a man was charged to accomplish that feat. He had to be God because only God could. Our great high priest who passed through the heavens is Jesus, the Son of God. Now why is this important for us to hear today? Because our last point, He is the center of our confession. Because our great high priest, Jesus, the Son of God, is the center of our confession. Look at what the author of Hebrews wants us to do with the information there at the end of verse 14. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For 2,000 years, Christians have been formally formally and informally, confessing Jesus Christ as our perfect sacrifice, as our high priest, as the Son of God, and as resurrected Lord. In 325 A.D., Christians meeting together in the city of Nicaea, in modern-day Turkey, developed a formal creed with the purpose of battling heresies that were developing about the nature of Jesus. In particular, in this one, Arianism. Instead of confessing Christ as the God-man who died a substitutionary death for our sins, the Arians at the time were saying that Jesus Christ was a created offspring of God, making Him the literal Son of God. That's the way they taught it and understood it. Modern day Mormons and even Jehovah's Witnesses believe what Arians believed, essentially, about Jesus. So a group of Christians in 325 A.D. come together to battle Arianism. And in an effort to do that, to hold fast to our confession that had been developed over 300 years now through the writings of the apostles in the New Testament, in an effort to hold fast to that confession of the true Christ, 
The Council of Nicaea comes together and establishes a written confession of Christian doctrine that says this about Jesus Christ. And in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, begotten of God the Father, the only begotten, that is of the substance of the Father, God of God, light of light, true God of true God, begotten, not made, of the very same nature of the Father, by whom all things came into being, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, who for us, humanity, and for our salvation came down from heaven, was incarnate, became human, was born perfectly of the Holy Virgin Mary by the Holy Spirit, by whom He took body, soul, and mind, and everything that is in man, truly and not in semblance. He suffered, was crucified, was buried, rose again on the third day, ascended into heaven with the same body, and sat at the right hand of the Father. That's a full confession. Now, although it has fallen out of favor in our culture, the truth is and always has been that there are beliefs about Jesus that will damn you to hell. Now, in spite of most of the religious world trying to convince you that we're all really saying the same thing, including some voices in the culture that you probably listen to, people from Mormon backgrounds and from various others will seek to convince you that, hey, we're all saying really the same thing. One day, he's just going to come down here and say, why couldn't y'all just get along? Why couldn't y'all just be on the same page? We might be tempted to consider this person or that person and think to ourselves, but she, she's so nice. I know she's not, she doesn't believe the same things exactly that I do about Jesus, but she's so nice. She's nicer than most Christians I know. Surely, surely it's not going to happen that when she dies, that God's going to send her to hell for eternity? Can you, she gives more to the poor than I do. My goodness. Listen, in the world that God created in the beginning, man lived in peace and perfect harmony with our Creator, and Adam and Eve did not have a hard time believing the truth about God. He didn't. He knew exactly who God was and had no problem believing the truth about Him. But the serpent deceived them by getting them to doubt what God said. Do you believe God is good and that what He intends for you is good? Or do you believe He's hiding things from you? That's implicit in the temptation of the serpent there in the garden. Did God really say, Oh, you'll surely not die. See, God knows. He's hiding something from you. He knows that when you eat of it, you'll become like Him, knowing the difference between good and evil. See, God is... Not reveal, he's, not, he's not playing all the cards. He's keeping some very close to the vest, you see. The reason that false belief is damnable is because it's rotten fruit from the same rotten and sinful tree that has been plaguing humanity ever since Adam believed the lie of the serpent in the garden. Before then, he had no problem with who God was, after then, big problems. It's damnable because it is a result of sin in who God the Son and the person of Jesus Christ truly said He was and is. It's doubting the actions that He took 
that he actually lived a perfect life, that he actually died the death that I deserve, that he atoned for the sins of his people. You see, if he becomes less than human, or if he becomes less than God, he cannot accomplish that feat. So it calls into question his sacrifice. It's not just about not believing the exact same things I do about Jesus. It's about calling into question who He is and what He did. It's calling into question His Word. It's refusing to believe that He actually rose from the dead by the power of God, where it was confirmed in His resurrection once and for all that He is indeed the Son of God. It's rejecting His ascension to the right hand of the Father. It's denying His ongoing role as our great high priest who passed through the heavens on behalf of His people. And ultimately, it's denying His right as judge over His creation. You see, the Nicene Creed doesn't stop there. It goes on for one more line, and it says this about Jesus. He will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will never end. Yes, it matters very much what we believe about Jesus. No, we're not all saying the same thing about Jesus. Denying these things about the Son is calling God a liar. Now the truth about Jesus is is the center of our confession. And that's what our author is telling us we must hold fast to. This is who he is. And as a group of people that he's writing to, to be honest, that want to flee Christ and go back to Judaism because of the persecution that they have now faced, you can see why he's saying you must hold fast to this confession. To flee, to go back, to leave, to turn to something else is to turn to something false. It's to be damned forever. Don't you see? For Jesus to be the center of our confession, we mean confessing Jesus as your high priest, your great high priest and son of God with your mouth and believing in your heart that God had raised him from the dead and that that's the only way to heaven. For him to be the center of our confession, We mean that we do not recognize Jesus as one among many, but as our one and only Savior and King. For Jesus to be the center of our confession, we mean that our allegiance to Him supersedes all other allegiances, whether prophets or cults or religions or parties. It's to Christ since they do not believe what is true about Jesus. But why is it important that we believe this about Jesus? How is it that belief can save a soul from eternal death? That's a reasonable question for anybody who's thinking through this to ask. Why is it that I must believe this And somehow, by believing that thing, my soul is saved from eternal damnation. What do you care what I believe? In other words, when Jesus turns to his disciples in Matthew and he asks that question, what about you? Who do you say that I am? His disciples answer, particularly Peter, chimes in in Matthew 16, 16. Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. See, Jesus tells Peter right there that what he believes about him is evidence of a heavenly enlightenment. Peter, what you believe about me, what you have just confessed about me, that confession that you're holding fast to, is not 
a result of something that's just coming out of your mouth. That is not what we're asking for in the church. We're not saying we merely want you to just repeat after me and say these things and confess that you believe them. No, no, no. Jesus is saying, your belief about me is evidence of something going on deeper than that. What is deeper than that is a heavenly kind of enlightenment. That the Father Himself has opened your eyes to see the truth about me, otherwise you would not believe it. If it was merely a case of flesh and blood, then I could go around the room and I could say, just check this box and you'll go to heaven forever. But that's not what I want. It's a whole other matter to take the issues of Christ, the doctrine of Christ, and actually have it penetrate the deep layers of your heart where you actually are convinced of its truth deep down. To the point when you walk out of this room, if somebody was offering a scimitar to your throat to confess Christ, you would proudly do it and die. Now, what allows you to believe like that? Well, it can't be flesh and blood. It's got to be a spiritual kind of enlightenment. Why do we care what people believe when they get in the waters of baptism? Why have Christians cared so much about this confession about Jesus' nature for so long? Because what you believe is evidence of an internal change that can only be brought about by the Spirit of God Himself. That's why. It's also why as you look around the rest of the world, only Christians are saying this about Jesus. Every other religion will want to change it some way or another. Either he was not man, or he was not God, or he did not die, or he did not rise from the dead, or one thing after another, they will seek to change the Christian gospel. But you understand, Christian, that this is the center of our confession, not because words are the things that matter, but because the heart that is the one confessing it has been illuminated by the Spirit of God. It's the center of the Christian gospel. And it's to this confession about Jesus that we cling. But what we gain in clinging to this confession, not merely with our mouths, not merely with our minds, but with our hearts, what we gain is a great high priest who has passed through the heavens Jesus, the Son of God. But the question that always remains after every sermon is what about you? Who do you say that He is? Who do you say that He is? We're going to pray. Then we're going to take the Lord's Supper. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for Your Word. We're grateful for the doctrine of Christ person and work of Christ who died for us our great high priest who passed through the heavens Jesus the son of God I pray that you would give us endurance to hold fast to that confession in spite of what the world might think of us I pray for those in here who might have heard this for the first time that you might open their eyes to confess Christ as Lord, truly. In Jesus' name, amen. We're moving into a time of celebrating the Lord's Supper. It's going to be incumbent on me to explain what we're doing and who this is for. The Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six, For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. So, First things first, very basically, when we take the Lord's Supper as Christians, some of you may, may not have ever seen Christians do this or, or don't know what it's about at all. You may just be observing. That's fine. When we do this, very basically, we're remembering the death and sacrifice, the atoning work of Jesus Christ on our behalf. 
So it's a, it's a call to remember that as we celebrate this together. But the Lord's Supper is not only that. It's also a mark of identification. Only Christians do this, in other words. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 10, 16, and 17, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. So, taking the bread and the cup is a sign to everyone around you, essentially, that you are gladly participating, joining Christ in discipleship, that you are a disciple of Christ. You're proclaiming that whatever the cost, I will follow Christ. And in doing so, that makes us one body. We only... Christians are the ones united in this particular thing. It makes us one body as members of the global body of Christ, but it also makes us members of a church together, that we participate together in the taking of the bread and the juice. Now, we're not saying that this bread and this juice physically transforms into anything. It doesn't literally become the body and blood. If you're coming from a Catholic background, that would be what Roman Catholics believe. That's not what we believe. We're proclaiming this as a memorial of Christ's sacrifice for us, It's identifying mark of our fellowship with Him and with each other. But in addition to remembering Christ, Paul goes on in the same passage, he says, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So it's those things, but it's also an opportunity for us to examine ourselves before partaking. So in the event that perhaps there was something in the sermon or maybe something in one of the songs or scripture readings that brought to mind sin that you have not yet confessed, this is not a time for you to just say, well, I can't take the Lord's Supper because I sin. Well, then nobody would take it. Okay, That's not what we're saying. We're saying it's a time for you to confess that sin to the Lord and to go before Him with a clean conscience then and take this with a clean conscience. So the Lord's Supper is not something we have to take in somberness where everybody's just like, you know, Keep your eyes focused forward. Don't look at anybody and God forbid you smile. Like, this is not what it is. It's, it's about soberness. It's spiritual sobriety that we're well aware of where our heart stands before the Lord. So the Lord's Supper is not for those who are curious about Christ, not even for those who maybe in the sermon have said, yeah, I want to follow Jesus. I'm going to take the Lord's Supper now. That's, that's not what the Lord's Supper is for. It's for those who have gone forward with their public faith in Christ through baptism. You've been baptized. The church has, has, even, has even recognized the faith that you confess to everyone. You've confessed it publicly. You've been baptized. And then after being baptized, you are now free to partake in the Lord's Supper. So before we do that, any baptized person who has gone forward with their faith in baptism is free to take with us, to join with us in the Lord's Supper. Uh, those who have who have not been baptized, following a public profession of faith in baptism, uh, I would ask you to refrain. In the spirit of sobriety, though, I would like us to take just about 30 seconds or so in a moment of prayer, uh, private prayer, and confess any sin that still remains on your heart before we partake of the elements. You will remove the bread, take it in your hand. On the night our Lord was betrayed, He told His disciples, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Jesus is telling His disciples that there will, be a, there will come a day when He returns, when the kingdom of God is fulfilled, where He will once again pass the elements to us. He will eat with His people again. We will feast in the resurrection. That night, though, He took the bread. When He had given thanks, He broke it, gave it to them, saying, This is My body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of Me. With the wine, He also taught them to look forward to the resurrection. He said, For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. So when we take the juice, we're not only remembering the blood that He shed for us on the cross, but we do so knowing that 
our Lord is fasting from the fruit of the vine until we can all join Him around the table. So taking this, we are agreeing together that we long to see that day. That night, however, He took the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. We're going to pray. We're going to sing a chorus of the doxology. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful to come together as a, as a church body and to celebrate the resurrection, your death, burial, and resurrection for us, to take away our sins. I pray that you would increase our faith. I pray that you would give us boldness. I pray that you would help those in this room who might be unbelieving, who might have heard the gospel for the first time, who might have heard salvation that can be had in Christ alone, who've seen Christians partake of the Lord's Supper together. Would you give them eyes of faith to look at the gospel that is in front of them, to look at what we confess about Jesus, to earnestly desire a great high priest who could cleanse them to the uttermost, make them a new creation. To hear the words of Paul in Romans 8, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. What freedom we have in Christ. I pray that they would want it. Open their eyes of faith to draw them near, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.